Hello and welcome my budding theologians. This is Joel Willoughby, founder of Brains and Bibles. I'm so glad you could join me today for another morsel of high quality theology. You can go to my Facebook page, Brains and Bibles. You can check out some uh, info there. I have a website, brainsandbibles.com, and you can uh, donate a tax-deductible gift or request me to speak at your church or event through the website. Um, if you like the videos on you, YouTube here, then go ahead and like those videos. Interact with me in the comments, and then if you have not subscribed to the channel yet, please do that. Uh, for a limited time, I'm not sure how limited that time is, but for a limited time, I have these cool mugs. I have these cool mugs, Brains and Bibles. You see that with the nice little logo there and everything. And uh, it's two-tone, got the black and white, it's the inside. This thing's actually loaded with coffee right now. And, and it'd be hard to see because I, I drink my coffee black, right? Yes, I don't pollute it with cream and sugar. So, uh, so it'd be hard to see with the black inside there even. Oh, maybe a little bit. There we go. Okay, but uh, love, love coffee. Mmm. And this is one of my favorite mugs. Um, I can fit four Willoughby sausage fingers into this this handle here, as you can see. Ah, that that shows it's a good, sturdy mug. It's stoneware. It's strong. Um, it is 16 ounces, I do believe. And um, I will gift it to you. I will ship it to you, okay? Uh, for a minimum donation of $50. That's tax deductible, $50. Now, of course, this is not a $50 mug, right? But I want you to help me promote theology, good apologetics all around the world. And so as a thank you for doing that, for a minimum of $50 tax deductible gift, I will gift you this mug and I'll even send it to you, okay? And that's included in the price. It's included. I will help you, okay? Please help me. All right, so this video, starting with this video, um, I am going to talk to you essentially about how the apostles in the first century wrote in Koine Greek and their finished products were inspired scripture and it went to churches and it got copied, it was spread, and then all of a sudden, these couple thousand years later, well, a little less than that, but uh, roughly, we have all these tons and tons, this big plethora of English translations today. And that may be pretty confusing, and you may have even heard of some controversy and things of this is a bad translation, this is a good translation, this is a better translation, this is the best translation, or even the only translation. And so uh, I want to clear up some of that stuff, and without showing any bias, and I would like to keep it simple, um, this gets into what's called textual criticism, and I'll talk about that later in this video. Um, and I, I, it's a rabbit hole that goes very deep, very deep. There is no real end to it. You'll study the rest of your life full time and never come to the end of all of this. And so I'm going to give you a, a good beginning understanding of all of these things, of first century apostleship, writing scripture to having the many English translations today. So this is just the first of the videos that will explain these things. And then uh, with your interest, I might uh, dive off into a couple other directions, but this is only concerning the New Testament, which was a written, originally written in Koine Greek and much different, and I'll talk about that. Uh, and then we're gonna see, we're gonna kind of um, sift through the many translations that are out there today and help you decide what is best for you and uh, you would have an educated understanding of what you're reading, where it came from, okay? Okay, so let's begin with the original text. The original text, okay? Um, these, of course, are what the original authors completed, such as Paul writing to uh, the church of Ephesus, you know, the book of Ephesians, right? The letter to the Ephesians. So these ancient texts are called manuscripts. That's what we call them, manuscripts. There's going to be uh, quite a few definitions through this series, but it's going to help you to, to uh, engage in the conversation, or, or if you start to read books on the subject, it'll help you get a lot further, a lot faster to know some of this basic vocabulary with it. So these ancient texts are manuscripts, okay? And the original manuscripts are called autographs. Autographs, okay? Those are the original manuscripts. What Paul actually wrote or had someone write for him uh, originally, that first document. That's an autograph, okay? So unfortunately, it's kind of a it's kind of a rough thing, but unfortunately, there are no autographs today. 
None. We don't have any. Nobody has any. They don't exist. Um, that would be very convenient. It'd be very wonderful if we had all the autographs because that would that would greatly reduce, um, I believe, the number of translations. That would also greatly reduce um, some arguments. There, people are always going to argue because people are people. They have sin natures and things, but but it would reduce them. Okay, uh, we don't have it, so okay, no use of talking about it anymore. Um, so what do we have? We have extant manuscripts. Extant just means surviving and known. Surviving and known. So it's the ones that we know about. In other words, there could be more, but no one's discovered them yet. Um, they're surviving, which means there used to be more. But this is what we have today. This is what we have today. This is what we know about today. Surviving and known. These are the extant manuscripts. Okay? No autographs, but we have extant manuscripts. These extant manuscripts are even different. Um, uh, many of them are different from the autographs in a few ways. Uh, the autographs were a bit different. They were written in all capital letters. All capital letters. And they had no spaces between the words. There was no punctuation, and there was no chapters or verses either. That may seem a little odd to you, huh? Mm. Coffee. You know, coffee's pretty spiritual. That's why there's a whole book called Hebrews, right? Okay? Hey, um, Shebrews nowadays, right? Maybe? I don't know. Anyways, Hebrews is the name of the book. Okay. Um, so the autographs, all capital letters, no spaces between the words, no punctuation, no chapters, no verses. Um, but that's not that crazy. Uh, if you are native to a language especially, and if someone were to write in all capital letters without any spaces or punctuation, right, you could still make out what the message is. Okay, There'd be very, very few times where something would be unclear just based on that. Okay, um, and of course it clears it up knowing the context of the words and who wrote it and who it's to, right? That's why these are all important things when studying the Bible. So what extant manuscripts do we have, the surviving and known texts um, that were made after the originals, okay? Um, what, let's talk about that a little bit. There was intense persecution of Christians right off the bat in the first century. There was intense persecution um, mainly by the Roman government, right? And uh, that continued on until AD 313 with Constantine. There's this Edict of Milan, and then Christianity became legal. And um, there's a whole lot to that story, but it became legal, and then not just legal, but even popular, uh, which created its own issues. Uh, it's another story for another time, though. Um, this was a horrible thing. This persecution was a horrible thing, uh, but that God would use for his glory. That's one of the reasons that God is so great, is because there are evil things in this world, and he can take them and make something beautiful and good out of it. That's a powerful God. So, what's the beauty in this? Well, this is how the gospel spread like wildfire. The word of God, the gospel went everywhere. That was pretty amazing, okay? Um, so, what they tried to squash only flourished. Um, that's, that's really cool how that worked out that way. Um, there was an intensity to share scripture. This created a culture of Christians um, that were desperate for the word. They were just hungry and thirsty for it. Uh, Christians of all sorts were copying scripture and taking them throughout the whole world. That's a really cool thing, isn't it? Uh, of course, unfortunately, this means that, well, people being people could make mistakes in copying scripture um, this in combination with the conditions of persecution uh, means that these copies weren't preserved very well. Uh, so let's talk about that a little bit. Okay, so everyone was encouraged to make copies for obvious reasons, right? Um, there was a great mandate to make disciples of the whole world, to go to the uttermost part of the world, right? Jerusalem and then Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth everywhere, right? Um, so anybody didn't matter who you were, anybody that wanted to actually copy scripture could copy scripture. There was there was no rule against it. Now, many people at that time and place were not literate, um, and then you had people that just did not have the means, the financial means perhaps even, to copy scripture. They didn't have the uh, the, the you know materials and things. 
And so you just had the group that was literate, that had the paper and pen, so to speak, um, more like papyrus uh, at first anyways. And so they, they had the, you know, the paper and pen, so to speak, and they had the literacy to actually make copies, uh, but there was no, um, no one excluded from that. So people make mistakes. They weren't all trained scribes. Now, when someone makes a mistake, what happens? And what kind of a mistake are we talking about here? Um, so before I continue there, I want to be very clear uh, that I firmly believe in the inspiration, preservation, and inerrancy of Scripture and infallibility, since we're going to use all those words too. Okay, so inspiration, Scripture is God-breathed. Preservation, God has preserved it. Um, we're not missing the inspired word of God today. Inerrancy, uh, which to keep it simple, inerrancy means there ain't no error in it. You know, kind of like read the word backwards there. Uh, you know, there's no errors. Uh, so then infallibility, so that everything that says something will happen, like prophecy or even proverbial things, when it says something will happen, it, it will happen. Um, and so I, I firmly believe all those things, and, and we could break down those doctrines in, in another video, okay? But let's, I, I just want to say that this, the end of this study will give you encouragement and confidence in your scripture, not the opposite. Uh, so just stay with me. Stay with me here. Um, so everyone was encouraged to make copies, but not everyone was very literate. They didn't have, um, you know, they didn't have time because of the persecution stuff to be very careful in copying. Uh, they, they weren't the best conditions, okay? Uh, and very few were copying from the autographs. The autographs, the original manuscripts, right, that only lasted so long. And so then you start to copy from copies. Well, when you copy from copies, uh, how accurate is that copy? Well, the closer it is to the original, um, probably the more accurate it is. We're going to come back to that thought here in a little bit. But, okay, so you have um, about 25,000 manuscripts today to study. About 25,000 manuscripts today to study. That's a lot. It's a lot. It's sort of a good problem to have, really. Um, this includes multiple languages, the 25,000 number. Uh, it includes multiple languages, which is um, almost 6,000, closer to 5,800, but uh, close to 6,000 Greek copies, that Koine Greek. Um, but that number 25,000 also includes Latin, Syriac, Coptic, and some other languages. Uh, this includes multiple materials like uh, papyrus, uh, which is from that papyri plant at the near the you know Nile River, the Egypt places like that. And uh, there's a process to make that. You can check it out sometime. Um, but basically, you know, dried plant, right, stacked together, and um, they could write on that. Uh, or it could be you know later on there's like animal skins, you know, like a leather kind of thing. And there's different other materials. Uh, this includes multiple locations. I mean, people are copying everywhere. Um, and then also this would include, uh, of course, some difficulty um, where you might even be in a scriptorium and you're trying to listen to somebody. You can't hear them that well and you're trying to copy you, or you, you think you heard them well and you actually didn't. Um, you, you know, you could be just copying. You look, look how big like the Gospel of Matthew is or something. Uh, you know, you eventually might start to just kind of nod off, fall asleep. You might make a mistake. Uh, there's accidental mistakes, but some mistakes, you know, not so accidental, very, very intentional. And there's a whole process in figuring that stuff out. Okay. Uh, so you have many, many manuscripts, tons of them. Well, how does this compare to other ancient manuscripts? That's a good question. How, how does this compare to those? Uh, you, you need to understand that we have um, a giant number. Uh, there's a phrase that's been coined that says we have an embarrassment of riches. Okay, so there, there's so much more than anybody else. So this, remember, about 25,000 manuscripts, right? This, there is more than 1,000 times the amount of data in manuscripts for the New Testament than any other. More than 1,000 times. That's, that's a hefty number. The extant manuscripts for other ancient authors date about 500 years after the original at best. That's a long time, okay? Now, the New Testament extant manuscripts are only decades or at most, at most, two centuries after the original writing. Um, there's the famous Homer, if you've heard of him before. Homer comes in second place to the New Testament as far as the uh, number of extant manuscripts are concerned. Uh, but he only has about 2,400. That's it. Okay? 
Wow, that's that's a big difference. Okay, so let's start to sort all these manuscripts out. All right, what's what's the real problem here? Let, let's get to the core issue. Uh, first off, we don't have any autographs. We've already kind of talked about that, uh, but that that is a big problem. So you know, if you if you're making a copy, if you're one of those people at whatever century back in the past, and you're making a copy. Well, you're not making a copy, you know, more than likely from the original, the autograph. And so if you see something unusual, well, what do you do? Um, so, you know, first off, you might not see anything unusual. You may not know any better. You're just going to copy whatever's there. And maybe it's, maybe there's something added to it or maybe not. Uh, you don't know, right? A lot of times. Uh, or you could see something unusual and you think to yourself, well, I kind of have a good grip on the apostolic doctrine and I don't think this is a part of it you see something unusual there or you can say I've heard this letter read before or I've read this letter before or something like that and you think I don't think that this phrase here or this word here is correct so what do you do well um, there are different options but typically what we see uh, throughout throughout the centuries typically what people would do is they would add, not subtract. So if there's something unusual there, they will add it to their copy. Uh, they won't just leave it out because what if you're wrong, right? What if you're wrong? And so they would typically keep it in. Um, you could understand uh, the problem of all these manuscripts as having too much scripture and not too little scripture. Okay, big difference there. Um, I'll emphasize that here in a moment. So the second real problem, so we don't have any autographs, but the other one is what we call variations. Okay, so with all these manuscripts that we have, there are variations. Uh, variation just means difference, okay? Just, there's, a, there's a difference of some kind. Uh, there are actually hundreds of thousands of variations in these manuscripts. Uh, but but uh, a lot of it is, is, is very trivial. It doesn't matter at all. It's like dotting an I, you know. If you were to read something and uh, three of the I's didn't have the little dot over the lowercase I, that's not going to confuse you as to what the letter means, right? So even though you have this giant number of variations, most of them, the overwhelming majority, are as simple as that dotting the I kind of thing. Very obvious what the problem is, okay? Um, so there are um, so so going back to the idea of too much, not too little. It, it's like we have 102 percent of scripture, not 98 percent of scripture. So you just have to figure out well what two percent isn't scripture. That that's that's more of the problem uh, as people are sifting through the manuscripts, deciding what is scripture. So the good news with all these variations, the good news is if you were to take every single variation and you were just to throw it away, okay? Or if you took every single variation and you were to add it all in, either way, if you did either one, you would not lose any doctrine or any practice of living the Christian life. None of that would be lost, none of it, okay? Some things get moved around. Uh, maybe you don't have as many verses to prove a certain thing. But no actual doctrine or way of living for Christ would actually be lost if you added all the variations in or took them all away. So that, that's kind of comforting as well. So the real problem is that we do not have any autographs and more text than the autographs. So those two things there, okay? So there are different philosophies for sorting out all these variations in these mini manuscripts, okay? So two big schools of thought here. One, some choose earlier manuscripts because they were closer to the autographs chronologically, okay? They're closer chronologically to the autographs. So they say, well, there's less chance of it being wrong then, right? Because you're copying errors and stuff, so there's less of a chance for there to be errors. Um, so copies were made, mistakes were made. Um, there'd be less of those in earlier copies in theory, more in future copies, okay? Well, the flaw in this philosophy, though, which, which that's, a, that's a valid thought, by the way, but the flaw here is that earlier does not necessarily mean less mistakes. Not necessarily. Um, there are actually many other factors to consider. Um, it's, it's not that simple. So it would also be inaccurate 
to picture a straight line of copies, okay? So some people would think of it this way. You have the original autograph here, and then you're going to make a copy, and then you make a copy of that copy specifically, and then a copy of that copy specifically, and you keep going throughout all the centuries until today, okay? Um, that's not exactly how it happened. It was more of a ripple. So it's like, you know, if someone made 100 copies off of the autograph, and then you have 100 copies off of each of those first copies, and then 100 copies off of each of those second copies, right? So the problems are not as multiplied because you have all these others coming off of them, okay? So there is a there is kind of a straight line, um, but you know when this when this copy is made, it's going to go somewhere else. They're going they're going everywhere around the world, um, so you don't have this necessarily straight line of errors adding up. Okay, not necessarily. All right, so then there's a second major thought uh, philosophy of sorting out these manuscripts. You know which is right, which is wrong. Some choose the larger agreement of manuscripts. Okay, so um, they, their thinking is that would reflect what was most accepted, the larger agreement. You know, more people are saying, yes, this is, this is correct. They're not going to copy the other thing, okay, whatever it is. Um, of course, there are other philosophies, and there's hybrids of these major philosophies uh, mixing together depending on the situation. There are, there, like I said, there's other variables involved uh, in choosing what is to be the most accurate text of Scripture. The flaw in this school of thought, though, is in thinking that something is better simply because people copied it more. There can be many reasons why something was copied more. Many reasons. Uh, even just, you know, you, you were able to, to get a whole lot of people together to mass produce some copies or something. You know, there, there are tons of reasons why there could be uh, many copies of something, not necessarily because it's truthful. That's not the only reason, right? This process of finding the original writing is called textual criticism, and so that's what um, that's what uh, the major the major core idea of all the different translations is. This thing called textual criticism. Now, when you first hear that, there might be a red flag that comes up in your head, and you think we're criticizing the Bible. That doesn't sound right at all. Okay, so big question here, is textual criticism helpful? Well, we're going to stop there today, and I'm going to come back to that question uh, next in the next video here. And so I hope you enjoy this. I hope you look forward to more, and I'll probably have two or three more videos like this. I might split it up differently, um, but let's dig deep together. What is the most important thing if you're interested in the Bible? the Bible itself, <laughs> right? Uh, because that's where all our information comes from. So I hope you stay on this journey with me uh, and help spread high quality theology all around the world. Don't forget about brains and Bibles, okay? Uh, don't forget about it. Pray for me. Pray for the ministry uh, that the Lord's will will be done. Thank you so much for watching.